addressing your target groups, you don't know who they actually are, well, you're in good company. My name is Pascal Kobe. I'm a communications consultant specializing in agriculture and rural development. And I want to talk to you today about a problem that I find quite common in development cooperation communications. That is that there is a whole lot of target groups put down onto paper. There's a whole lot of different purposes put down onto paper, but still you miss the target groups when it comes to actually moving on and moving towards usually uh, using your tools and so forth. Why is that? Let's first have a look at the different purposes. You have two different, very different type of purposes for communications in development cooperation. The first one is relaying the goodness of your project. You raise awareness about your project. You want to make sure that your donors know about it. And this sort of, let's call it PR type of communications. And then you have communications that's more from within the project where you want to use the tools to actually promote some of the targets that your project has in itself. Let's say you're in a nutrition related project out in Cambodia and you want to make sure that you or you want to use video, for example, to relay certain information about breastfeeding or so, anything like that to your target group, which is lactating mothers. That's very different setup. Now, let's look at the first type for this. When it comes to raising awareness about your project or talking about the impact of your project, you have usually, let's say, three types of target groups. The first is your broad public. The second is more narrowed down, the more interested public. And the third one would be something like your politicians, your policymakers. And then we will have to talk about the two different types of ways that you can actually relay your information, how you can, what, what kind of purpose your communications in itself might have. There's two very different things. First of all, you can try and convince your listeners of something, or you can try to relay some facts, data, information. Now, why is that important? Because we know from lots of different researches, research out there that if you want to convince somebody, you need to actually use emotions. So using facts and figures is not gonna work. So there's your first problem in the usual uh, communication in development cooperation projects. You are scientifically driven, you use facts and figures. Meanwhile, you actually want to convince somebody of something because you want him to do something. Why is this important? Because as you might realize, it's pretty clear if you want to use emotions or you need to use emotions because you want to convince somebody, then you would have to use a completely different approach. You put into your video completely different elements as if you would work with facts and figures. Facts and figures, you show results, you put in inserts of, of facts and figures of the project and so forth. That's a completely different different way to approach the thing. I'm gonna put into the links uh, down below in the comments, I'm gonna put a link about the an article that I really love in that regard. It's from the New York Times and I keep on posting it all the time. It says, uh, it's called facts and figures and why you don't convince us something or facts and figures don't really work. Now there is another reason why this is important and that is because in the real world of your project communications, you will have goals from your project that translate into goals for your communications activity that are more on the emotional side, that are more on the convincing side, and there are others that are more on the fact side. So if you want to be successful with that, you will have to separate those goals and move that into different approaches. So don't try to mix that all in one. Let's have a look at the first target group that I mentioned, the broad public. Well, this is a very unique target group, even though you might think this is quite common. 
But if you really think of it, for your development cooperation project, it might be, it's definitely going to be very rare that you're going to have the resources to actually approach a lot of people out there. Well, you need a lot of resources, not, not because only you need to spread your wings so far, it's also because the broad public is basically people that are generally not interested in what you have to say because you have a very specialized message. So you will have to use very unique tools and you need to really use high tech on a lot, lot of resources in terms of cameras, in terms of special effects, in terms of uh, stars that you want to have to feature in, in your project. So all that contributes to the fact that you, the whole thing will, is going to be very expensive. Now, why would you want to do that in the first place? For your development project, it's probably not good to have people being convinced of what you're doing is great. Um, you have a very unique, narrow angle at your things and the broad public's opinion about that is probably not gonna make any difference. There is, at some point, sometimes the approach by certain agencies to actually invite actors and use high paid camera teams and so forth and travel with these actors and personalities, uh, celebrities into the bush, even though the bush doesn't really exist anymore and have them talk about development projects. Now, what I find weird about this is in particular that you use taxpayers' money to convince basically taxpayers of what your, that your work is actually great. Now, if you think of this, it's, it's a problem of big government, I guess, because if you would do that on your uh, local government level, it's, that would never happen. Imagine the mayor wants to get reelected and he, want, he convinces or wants to convince all the councillors that he needs to spend a whole lot of uh, uh, budget from the, uh, from the town on um, making a little video about how well his uh, tenure as a mayor has been. The councillors will certainly not pay for that. Well, that's what's going to happen here. Well, this is what's going, what, what is usually happening here. You spend a whole lot of money off the taxpayer on convincing the taxpayer that the work is well. Now, so, as I said, in local government, this is never gonna happen. Now, a completely different thing would be if you would say, if you would have a mayor who's been running a project about littering in the public parks and you want to use the results from what you've been doing so far and build that into a campaign against more littering in the future. See, there, the purpose is actually changing. You use positive experience, but you actually build that into a project-related communication. You want to have your target group participate in your initiative. That's something completely different as if you have a a target group that is in one country and you talk about things that are in a completely different country out, let's say in a development country. That doesn't translate into one another. That's why I'm saying this is a bit of a different target group for development cooperation. Let's have a look at the second target group, which is the so-called interested public. What does that actually mean if you really look into that? Well, I guess what it really means is that you talk about people that work in development co cooperation um, that are who are journalists who specialize in that area people that have been traveling a long time or that have been working in a project at some point it's all people that lean towards doing these sort of things like helping others out and have been working in this and then you have researchers and 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 um professors and so forth that have that that are working in this area why am i saying this because usually when we target this target group the um we overestimate their size we 
overestimate or we underestimate the fact that they are converted. And we underestimate the fact that we don't need to convince them because that's what it means preaching to the converted. So any approach that goes towards convincing them is ill-conceived. What we can do is relay information to them. Now they usually have quite unique information needs that are more um, specialized in a sense because these people know a lot about the project and they want details. And these details we can provide. Now, tempting is this part because here we're talking to someone who's really interested in our stuff. We can go into the nitty gritty stuff and they still absorb this thing. But going back to the first point, we overestimate the fact that this is a small number of people that they have a, only a certain reach within their own community. And we basically overestimate their numbers. Um, there's, when you invite people for a workshop, you'll see there's uh, maybe 100 RSVPs, which is much less than what you typically think because you constantly overestimate the point. And then there's only maybe half of them actually showing up at the event. And one last point about this target group that is quite challenging is the concept applied to this target group in terms of communication is then broadened and used for all target groups often. Yeah? The, it's generalized that other people believe in this way. You split up in different target groups and once you start working, you feel home and all this detail and all this information and all of a sudden your approach becomes like as if it was only for this target group. And you're talking, yeah, we have different target groups, but you only use one approach and that's the approach that you use for this target group. That's a trouble. Now, thirdly, you have the target group politicians and policymakers. Now let's have a look at these guys. First, the politicians. Politicians are deciders. What do you need to know about deciders? Well, deciders are very different from other people who are just interested. Deciders, in this case, have to juggle a budget. They have to actually decide not only to spend your, if you want to uh, convince them of spending money on your issues, then you basically need to acknowledge with them. And you need to show them in your communications that you know that they have to then decide against spending, not spending some money in other areas, which is quite complicated and which is very important. So if you want to convince them, you need to acknowledge their predicament. Otherwise, they're never going to listen to you. Because you don't, if, if you don't show to them that you prepared yourself in terms of the information about them that you absorbed, then they're not going to absorb what you have to say about them. Secondly, you have the area of policymakers. Now, this one is really a favorite of mine. Because, f first of all, policymakers policy wonks, they're also sometimes called, are by definition people that don't have decision-making powers like the politicians. So they're not really the same at all. They prepare papers, let's say, that go into the policy-making process. Where do these guys sit? Well, ideally, they would be sitting in a line ministry that's actually involved in this sort of legislation policy uh, wh where your where your your um, issue is actually related to where it's actually situated. Then you might have some people that you might want to call lobbyists and so forth. They're trying to influence it. They provide input. They provide resources and so forth to actually implement this white paper process that goes into a policy. So if you want to reach these sort of people, 
you need to go on in a completely different way than you would do with politicians. That's very important. Now, one more very critical point about this is the concept of influencing this white paper policy making process and talking to policy makers is, is somewhat blindly translated into policy maker communications approach in development cooperation. And this is completely ill conceived because if you think of it, try to come up with a couple of names, emails of, of, of real people, of real policy makers in some of the development countries. So I'm not talking about China, India and so forth, but talking about real small countries, there is basically no policy makers. You will not find them. And if you look there, because there's simply not that infrastructure. If you really look at this closely, you will find that development agencies are providing the input. They provide the consultants quite often that write the papers. They talk to the ministries and they accept those papers. And quite often they do that because they believe if they accept this, the same agency will come up with another project and actually finance what they propose. So you're finding yourself in a constant loop there and your communications is not going to get out there if you think you can communicate to these people because these people might be some, might be some other people. It might be people from your own project or from another, from another agency in a, from that, that let's say you are with the German agency and that's the American agency. We all know who they are. Yeah. So that's, that's actually a weird concept. And communication is not going to help you out of that, that funny situation. So to wrap this all up, how do you conceive your target groups in a way that actually helps you getting to your project? Decide whether you want to convince this or whether you want to relay facts. Decide who your target groups are, but try to come up with a couple of names that are of people that are in those target groups, real names of people, a couple more than just two or three. And then decide what is the purpose of your information relay. And then you can decide on how you actually want to approach the whole thing only then. And then once you've done your analysis, which means splitting things up, don't throw them all into one pot and give it one approach, one size fits all. Okay. It's not going to work.